Hebrews chapter 11. This is part two of probably four parts in the book of Hebrews. We've been looking at what is now been referred to frequently as the Hall of Faith. The Hall of Faith is pretty much an overview of the Old Testament of men and women who have trusted God when God worked and spoke to them about things which were unprecedented. And I used that word a lot last week. I'm going to use it this week. Things that there was no precedent, no background, no history to say, oh, well, that happened before, so I can step out in faith and do something like that again, just like they did. These are people who took that step of faith just because God asked them to. And the way that it was perceived by others, the way that it could have been understood by others would have been foolish or absurd, crazy, and yet they stepped out in faith and did as God called, which is our foundation to do likewise, to hear God's word, to answer. You remember Samuel when he was small, and this is a tip that we can use for young parents or grandkids and talking to their, their parents, our children, that Samuel heard God speak and then he went into uh, Eli, or over to Eli, who you'll recall that Samuel had been dedicated to the temple, talking about dedication uh, to the temple. They, they actually gave their son to Eli for the work in the temple. So he was now a temple kid or a tabernacle kid, actually, more specifically. And he was now being raised by the high priest, Eli. And the Holy Spirit began to speak. The Lord began to speak to Samuel. And he went into Eli and said, you called me. And Eli said, no, I, I didn't call you. So he said, go on, go back to sleep. And then the Lord spoke to, once again, little Samuel. And uh, then he comes into Eli and he says, you called. And he said, no, I didn't call. But this time, go to sleep. And, and when you hear that call, answer, here I am, Lord. Which is really what it's all about for us today. We see this example, and we're trying to encourage people to just wait and listen and to receive the instruction from the Lord. And Many times that comes by that initial encouragement and drawing, but many times it comes now, as it says as we began in the book of Hebrews, and times past, uh, God spoke through the prophets, but in these times, he speaks to us through who? His son, Jesus Christ. And so the Lord is going to be speaking to your heart, to my heart, in unique ways. It can be something where he places something in your mind where you begin to think and consider who God is, or you begin to have a stirring in your heart where you're convicted of sin, your conscience comes alive after perhaps being calloused, and now your conscience is open and receptive. But more specifically, we prove all of those things, and Jesus continues to speak to our hearts through his word. As we're reading his word, and you, or many of you, I believe all of us could say, <clears throat> that we're familiar with the time or times when we've been venturing through God's word and he's spoken to us. When the ink on the page becomes something that becomes very personal, very specific, and very contextual, meaning that it's very consistent with the word of God. That it's not just something that we're reading here, but it's something that is being spoken to our hearts. And it's that that we're called to step out in faith in. Romans 10, 17 specifically says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our faith is established as we're hearing God speak to us. And that happens as we're in God's word. The logos becomes something that it's the account. And what happens is now this becomes something that it becomes personalized. And God is speaking to us through his word. And it's pretty amazing. He'll also speak to us while we're in prayer. He'll remind us of somebody.
He'll cause us to be, maybe remind us of a scripture to be bold and courageous when we may not want to pray aloud. He may uh, speak to us as we're gathered together among other believers and somebody says something and encourages us, gives us a, an encouraging, edifying word. And if we question whether that's from the Lord, we can go back and, and search the scriptures and, and see it validated by the testimony of two or three, just as we have seen in times past. But this hall of faith is unique in that it's made up of believers who did things that were unprecedented. They hadn't been done before. Now, we could say, well, what's left for me to do that hasn't been done before? Well, you may be the person in your family who all the rest of your family doesn't know Jesus, but you're the person that does an unprecedented step toward him, to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And you step out in that, and they don't want you to become a crazy Jesus freak. They don't, they, they see you and they think that's absurd or ridiculous. They're concerned for you. It could be a cult. But you're grounded by God's word and you make that step of faith. You take that step of faith. There's many things that are unprecedented, that is unknown territory for us. And we need to be willing to go there when God speaks to us. So this hall of faith, it really is about believers who decided, okay, I believe it was Greg and I having a conversation about this, just having to do a church, but instead of like the Tower of Babel, people trying to make a name for themselves, the Hall of Faith is made up of people who wanted to make a name for Jesus, or they wanted to glorify God with their lives. John the Baptist, very radical looking guy. He had a Nazarite vow. He was furry all over because you're not allowed to cut your hair if you've had a Nazarite vow. And so, you know, he didn't shave his arms or back and or, nor his beard or anything like that, nor his nose hairs or his ear hairs or any of those types of things. He uh, ate locusts and wild honey and he dressed in camel hair. And yet when people came to him, when Jesus was there, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then he says, I must decrease and he must increase. And this is what the Hall of Faith is all about, is decreasing our lives and trusting God and increasing or glorifying him with the decisions that we make, the steps of faith that are radical, that are seemingly insane, but by his word, you take that step. So, we're going to be picking up at verse 7, and we're going to sort of finish up the book of Genesis. It's like, I thought we were in Hebrews. We're starting in the book of Genesis. It's only 50 chapters. It won't take very long. The Hall of Faith is, we've started out talking about the foundation of things, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, re restate it or reread it and in verse 1. It's important that we start there, and then we'll pick up at verse 7. But in verse 1, it says, now faith is the substance, or you remember, that's the foundation, the concrete. You remember that from last week? It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the proof. It's the conviction that we have. It's the faith that we have, which, remember, is established based upon God speaking to us. So, it goes on in verse 2, it says, And for by it, faith, the elders obtain a good report. Which, you'll remember that good report literally means, it's where we get the word martyred from. And the good report is to stand to the point of death on a conviction, on a belief that we have. To stand with that conviction, even if nobody else is going along with us, that we stand by it. That's what these elders were all about. So in verse 3 it says, in the very beginning it challenges us. We have the, the creation account, which is wonderful that it's just in the very beginning because it challenges us to say, what, do, what are we going to believe with respect to the rest of the Bible if we can't get past the creation account? If we have trouble with a six-day creation 
and a seven day, day seven rest, then we're going to have problems with the rest of the Bible. Because there are other things that seem crazy that seemingly go against science. And subsequently, we end up having, if we are of that direction, we end up having a lot of problems. So it says here in verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds, which again, from last week, it was matter, time, space. That's what the worlds is in a literal sense. It's everything that we know. That the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear or were visible. So the things which were made were made by not things that are visible, but by just out of nothing. It's basically what it's saying. And all of the worlds, everything that we know, the, the, the you know, matter, space, time, everything has been called into existence by God's word. Specifically, as we look at um, John 1, we see that it's the word of Jesus, specifically, as he's there at creation. He's the one speaking it into existence, which is fascinating. We have the will of the Father. I, I love the world. And then he creates, he starts all of this. We've got matter and space, but he started time in order to establish salvation in those who would trust him by faith. He got that ball rolling. He willed for that to happen. Jesus called it into existence. And then it says that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep. That it was as though the work was happening if you wanted to call it work, the work was happening by the invisible Holy Spirit at the word of God, all of this coming together. I can't explain it. I just know that that's how it unfolds. And the writer of Hebrews is reiterating this. And then he goes on, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear or were seen. And then he immediately goes into the uh, account, the first person, to demonstrate faithfulness. Unprecedented faithfulness was Abel. He offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speak it. So there's a couple things that are happening here that we talked about last week, but specifically he offered a sacrifice, a sacrifice of an animal as opposed to grain, and it was an acceptable sacrifice. He made a sacrifice understanding that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And yet, Cain was just like, what do you need to do that for? Just give, just give some grain. Why take something of the flock? But he didn't have the understanding. He did this by faith. And then we come to verse 5. From Genesis 5, by faith Enoch was translated so that he would not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now this should be very important to us as Christians because his translation means that he went from one location immediately to another location. That fast. And... That in and of itself can be, well, I don't really know how I feel about that. But again, if we can't get through the first couple chapters of Genesis, we're not going to make it through the rest of the Bible because it's full of things that are going to challenge us in our understanding. But what was it that he did that was so remarkable before God was that he pleased God by believing God? And that's where we come to in verse 6, where it says, For without faith it's impossible to please Him. If we want to please God, then we need to understand that we need to believe Him. And it even says that, for he that first comes to God, are we coming to God? Some people aren't even making it past that. But he that comes to God, second, believes that He is. So, bad news for the, uh, for the atheist. So he's not going to come to God because he doesn't know what's come to. And it's not that he can't find God. It's just that he's unwilling to seek and search. Because God's all around. That's what we learned from Romans 1, right? So 
He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if you're seeking God, then sometimes people, Christians specifically, seek God and they're afraid of what they're going to seek and what they're going to find. Man, I'm going to find God and then he's just going <coughs> to nail me for something that I did wrong. But that's not what God's all about. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And if we seek him, we'll find him. If we ask, then it'll be given. And if we knock on the door, he'll open it to us. And we'll have fellowship with him. And so when we have a right theology or doctrine, understanding based upon the word, it means that it's pleasing to God to acknowledge that he is, to come to him, and to seek him, and to know that there is a great reward for having that time of fellowship. Do you believe that? Or is it just like, well, I didn't really know about that. I feel like God's always going to bust me for something. No, that's not what it's about. We come to him. We know he's good. And we seek him. And he rewards us as we come to him through that time of fellowship. And it's wonderful. Verse 7. We have our next example. It, from Genesis chapter 6 through 8, we have by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with Fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So Noah was a preacher, but he knew that the only people that were going to be saved were those in his house. That the very words and the very actions and activities that he was engaged in was just going to bring condemnation upon the world. Why? Because he was testifying to something that God will do, and yet people weren't believing, but he was testifying to it. And so as a result, they would end up finding out that they were dead wrong as a result. And yet the things that God was asking him to do were, again, unprecedented. There had been no rain. There had been no springs popping up and bringing water everywhere. There have been no floods. And so God has Noah build an ark, and he builds this ark where there's no water necessarily, no lakes or anything like that. He's just building this ark. People are coming by. It takes him 100 years to build this ark. You could say, well, is Noah being slack? Maybe. But maybe Noah was taking his time in order to fully get the word out for the sake of condemnation for those people who would reject so that everybody in the world would see that ark and instead of coming to know Jesus as a result or coming into the salvation the protection in this ark they would end up scoffing ridiculing and saying this is ridiculous he's he's crazy he thinks that th that there's going to be a flood we don't even really know what a flood is but he's talking about all this water that's going to come. And he's so presumptuous and mean-spirited and hateful to say that it's because of our sin. And yet he's just conveying what God has already spoken to him. Because he's preaching that they would reject. And in fact, that's exactly what they did. So if we go to Genesis 6, which I'm just going to read it because we're going to be all over in Genesis and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The earth is filled with violence. So getting ready for some of the <coughs> streaming through YouTube, we had to run some tests. So we spent extra, I've spent an extra amount of time in YouTube trying to get things going, but... You know how if you're on YouTube, different things pop up. And uh, one particular thing was this guy coming in to rob this, I don't know, convenience store. And so he comes up to the counter and he's got a gun and he's pointing it at everyone. And the guy standing next to him, all of a sudden, he's concealed carry, pulls out a gun, shoots him three times, once in the head. And it's getting a lot of likes. Way to go, bro. Good job. Concealed carry. Constitutional carry. we got to protect ourselves. 
And it's not that I'm against those particular things specifically, but it's the mindset, it's the attitude of violence which continues to escalate in our country and in this world. Violence is just as in the days of Noah, which is exactly what Jesus said. I think I have a reference here. Yeah. Uh, but as in the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And Noah did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So there's, this is telling us a couple things. First of all, Noah didn't know anything about a flood, or well, he was told about a flood, but he hadn't really personally experienced it. None of the people had, and yet he's out there preaching to be careful, come to salvation because a flood is coming. He's trying to communicate something that he hasn't experienced personally, but he knows by God's word that it's going to happen. Right? So is that similar to our same commission? How personal is our experience with heaven and hell? How certain are we experientially, empirically, of the things which Jesus says where hell is weeping and gnashing of teeth? We don't know by experience, but we know by God's word. And so we can be like Noah in the sense that there's no precedent for any of this happening. We've not had the world destroyed by fire or the heaven and the universe, all of that. It's not been destroyed by fire. And yet we believe it because we trust God and we believe God. And then he has shown himself to be trustworthy, not only in our lives, but prophetically time and again throughout Scripture. With respect to Jesus alone, hundreds of fulfilled prophecies that many of which he didn't have any control over. I mean, you can't control where you're going to be born. You can't control where your parents are going to have you, you know, take you and raise you. And the fact that it, there's a reference to being born in Bethlehem, going down to Egypt, and then being up in Nazareth. He's fulfilling things that he had no control over. And yet... It all bears testimony to the fact that God is outside of time, sees it all as now, and so he can call these things out and say to his prophets who are in time and say, this is going to take place. And speak to them and in their own vernacular and speech and style, they write, and yet we see the hand of God the voice of God speaking through all these various prophets in all of their uniqueness. Just like in the New Testament, we see, we read the letters of John, Peter, and Paul, and they are all very different in style. And yet we are receiving a singular message from the Lord as a result. So Noah, here he is, he's doing something which is crazy, but he's talking about the fact that, that there's going to be this rain coming, these springs busting forth, this flood that's taking place and uh, that would take place. And he builds this ark, this huge, huge ark. And he's plodding away at it, taking him a hundred years to build this thing. I think he could have built it quicker. I'm not saying that as a you know, criticism, you know, hey, you could have built that quicker, Noah. You know, but I think he could have built it quicker. But that there was a timeline and there was a need for it to take a hundred years for God's word to go forth and for it to accomplish what it had intended, which is exactly what we see Isaiah speaking about with respect to his word, where he says, My word will go forth out of my mouth and it shall not return void, but it will accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So God's word is going out. God's word is going out right now, and we have a decision. What am I going to believe about the creation? What am I going to believe about all of these things that there's a, you know, coming, that there was a destruction having to do with Noah, all of those types of things, much less the fact that the Son of God is returning. We have to make a decision. But God's word is true, 
And the thing that's unique about God's word is it will, for some, soften their hearts to receive him and to be born again. And for others, their hearts will be hardened. But it's still accomplishing what is intended. The word is going out. And so all of these that walked by the ark and said, <laughs> and rejected, and were lost in the flood, they had no excuse to say that they didn't have an opportunity to be saved. They had a hundred years worth of an opportunity to be saved, and, and they rejected. So there is a testimony of God's word against them. And I made reference to this from Philippians 2 last week, but every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are all going to have the understanding that Jesus is real. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then what's it say? That, they, you know, that we come to him or that we trust who he is as a result of coming to him, coming to God, that we believe that he is. Everybody is going to come to a point in their lives where they come to God and they believe that he is. But it's better to do it on this side of life than to die and then to be raised and then experience a second death where you behold, oh my goodness, I've made a terrible mistake. God is real. I'm even willing to bow down to him now, but it doesn't work retroactively for salvation. And so as we continue here, we, we look at Noah and we see the promise, first of all, that um, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence and I'll destroy them uh, with the earth. And specifically, Jesus talks about as in the days of Noah, so it would be with the Son of Man. The, the level of violence and the things that are going on, the eating and drinking and all the marriage, all of that stuff is going to continue, but things will get intense and intense more or heightened intensity each year, and we're seeing that. And you would think with all of this intensity that the next board is being put up on the ark, the next thing is being done with the ark, that you would say, wow, I've, uh, time's short. I've got to do something about this because that door is getting put up onto that ark. I'm seeing these critters going in two by two. I can't figure that one out, but I see these critters going in. And I know I'm running out of time. And the same thing is true having to do with the return of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the coming of the Son of Man. So he says later in uh, Genesis Chapter 6, he says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Uh, room shalt thou make uh, in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Well, this is an interesting thing. Why, why do you pitch wood on both sides? Normally, if it's a boat, you're pitching it on the outside because the water is going to be there. But God instructs him to pitch it on both sides, which would infer that there's an intention for there to be an ongoing preserved testimony of this ark and for decades centuries for thousands of years there's been evidence of the ark and just when we get to the point when maybe the ark might be falling apart and people are questioning it there at mount ararat i mean the wood is there the decks have fallen through but it's there we're not talking about up in the mountains we're talking about down at the foothills section of mount ararat it's there but just to give further testimony the fact that it was pitched on both sides we have some crazy guy australian dude northern kentucky here who's building an ark also to bear witness to that true event that took place thousands of years ago just to add insult to injury, right? Ken Ham, just kind of letting the world know that, hey, now you can see how big it is. Here's some scientific background that actually supports the Bible and uses the Bible as the 
foundation or the starting point with respect to what we, how we live and how we conduct ourselves. So with all of that said, um, it's a lasting testimony. And I believe that it is very specifically um, pitched on both sides so that it would last. And like I said, it's, it's still there. You can hunt it down. You can find it on the internet. It, it's studyable. So now we come to Genesis uh, chapter 12. We're going to talk about Abraham. This is verse 8. And it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go in, out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether or whither he went or where he went. Well, this is unprecedented also. So God tells Abraham, he says, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to take you to a place that is, this is a, a, a new place for you. I'm promising it to you. And I want you to go ahead and get up and go. So Abraham says, okay, where am I going? Well, I'll tell you. Just get started. Just take your first step. And then as you take that next step, I'll direct it. He's going to lead him from basically Babylon or Iraq into Canaan. What we know now is Israel. He's going to direct him all along that way. We don't know if he's going this way or that way, but we know that God's going to get him to this place. And Abraham, before he leaves, I'm sure he's telling people, yeah, hey, I'm going. God's given me some land and I'm getting ready to go. And they're saying, this is great. God be with you. Where are you going? I don't know. I have no idea. <clears throat> no, no scope. Is it north, south, east, west? I don't know. I'm just going to, I'm going to start walking and then I'm going to listen to him to tell me if I need to make a right turn, a left turn, a turnaround, or to go straight. But that's all he's got. But that's all he needs. See, And this is frequently how God works in our lives. We can be stopped in moving forward with what God wants to do in our lives because we're hung up over, well, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's going to happen. What, what could take place? I did the pros and cons list and it's looking like there's more cons than there are pros but Abraham it tells us very specifically when he was called to go out into the place which he should after receive for an inheritance what did he do he obeyed that that simply just obeyed and he went out not knowing where he went and by faith he sojourned, verse 9, in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs <coughs> with him of the same promise. Now, you'll remember from, let's see, as we got into talking about the tabernacle in the book of Exodus, there's a reference, of course, over to John, where it talks about Jesus dwelling with us and the literal word for dwelling with us is that he tabernacled with us he tented with us and so there's no coincidence that the way abraham journeyed he ends up in the promised land and instead of building big buildings and establishing himself he just rested himself in a tabernacle in a tent you could argue he just rested in jesus for where he was at he was vulnerable I mean, why do you build castles and cities with big city walls to protect yourself? Poor old Abraham, all he's got is some old tent. And people can look at us in the same way. They can just say, man, those Christians, they, they're just like, they're so naive. They're so clueless. They don't have any protection. And yet, you can rest in Jesus and know that if God be for me, who can be against me? He's my defense, I'll not be moved. Trusting in God's word. So I made reference to the Second Amendment earlier. I understand why we have that. If somebody is hurting another person, then you can maybe come into defense of them. It's like the military. Carla and I were having a conversation about the military as well. There's a reason for that. Because when 
you have people that are hurting other people, sometimes the only way to stop that is with a show of force. So without getting too much into arguing that point, let's think about it, though, from Abraham's standpoint. That he didn't have walls. We don't get any impression that he was particularly armed until he came to, you remember that story with Melchizedek, he went out with 613 of his trained men and, you know, beat them. Where did that come from, Abraham? Where did that come from? I don't know that it was that they were so well trained. I think that it was that God was with them and worked collectively with the training that they had and the, and the tactics that the Lord employed in them as they pursued and went forward. The point in all of this is that Abraham here is in an unwalled place. He's in Canaan. And Isaac is the same, and so is Jacob. And their only protection is a tent. Their only protection is a tabernacle. Their only protection is Jesus. And the same thing that I would say, having to do with all of us, that we can try to protect ourselves, we can have our sword, but if we live by the sword, we can die by the sword too. And... Everybody has to make this decision as far as how that works with their Second Amendment rights and so on. But truly, where is our faith if we look at Abraham, who is simply just in Canaan in a tent? He's in Canaan in Jesus. And so where else do, would, would we want him to be? Where else do we want to be? And I think it's a good, challenging question to consider. That we can sometimes use credit cards and weapons as fallbacks for our lack of faith. Instead of just saying, I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to trust Jesus. I'm going to tabernacle. He wants to tabernacle with me. He'll be my shelter from the wind and from the rain. But I'm always vulnerable, but I'm always safe. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe so it's about the name of jesus the person of jesus christ that we find our faith in and trust in and so we see this with abraham and then it goes on that by faith he sojourned in the land of promise in the strange country dwelling in tabernacles and verse 10 for he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is god so he's looking for something that's a lot more established, but he knew that it wasn't going to be in this world. That it was going to be something that God made. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord, right? So even if you have those walls, even if you have the bailout credit card or the huge, you know, cannon <laughs> that... It still comes down to trusting in God and knowing that he's the one. That's where I want to dwell. That's where I need to be. And I need to just be willing to wait for that. And to know that this body, even if it gets hurt in the process, it's still a place where I need to trust and be given over to God. Surrendered to him. So it goes on. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And then we talk a little, about, a little bit about his wife. In Genesis 17 and 18, verse 11 here, it says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Okay, so it's a little unprecedented for 90-year-old women to have a child. Not real normal. And we could say, well, you know, back in those days, they lived a lot longer. As we're going to read, Abraham was an old guy, and 100 years old means an old guy. Just like it does now, it applied then. And Abraham, I'm sorry, Sarah was an old gal. So she wasn't expecting to have children but there was a promise that was given that she would and so here she is 90 years old and she has a child verse 12 therefore sprang there even of one or of abraham 
and him is good as dead. So Abraham's 100 years old, he's good as dead. I hope I live to be 100 years old, so I'll be as good as dead. Right? So, um, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. So between an 80-year-old woman and a 100-year-old man and God's miracle by his word, his promise, there are innumerable children of Abraham and Sarah. And the writer, um, I'm sorry, this is uh, getting caught up with Hebrews, but Paul specifically says, having to do with Abraham, that those who are of faith are really the children of Abraham. And so now we can see that number really expand. Because you could maybe count, well, there's been this many Hebrews, this, this many Jews since Abraham's day. Oh, man, it's more than that. As the sand of the sea and as the stars of the sky, the people who would be saved by faith, who would continue by faith like Abraham did, who would trust and be children of Abraham by believing God. So, continuing... Verse 13, these all died of faith or in faith, not having received the promises and having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So first of all, they died in faith. Death is certain. That's what this is telling us. Death is certain. And the next question is, if death is certain, will you die in faith or in unbelief? That simple. We're going to die. Save the rapture, the translation that happens, because we please God, those who please God, who look for him and trust him and believe that he is and seek him and know that he's a rewarder of good things, those people will be translated. They'll be raptured. We may have that. But otherwise, everyone's going to die. So the question, are you going to die in faith or in unbelief? that easy, that simple, that straightforward. Well, if they die in unbelief, he's in a better place. Not so. We've heard that. I hope we haven't said it. Do we know people that died in unbelief? And you go to the funeral and say, well, he's in a better place. She's in a better place. Really, what's that based on? Any scripture background on that? Or what? what, what is this? It's floating around somewhere? What, what is it? Or is it just total annihilation? They cease to exist. Well, the biblical account says that presently, they're, if they're without the Lord, they're in hell. Then they're resurrected to judgment based upon their works. And if they have any sin, much less the many, then they're cast into the outer darkness. And that's the second death. I mean, so let's be true with respect to God's word and what we know about it. That's not to be harsh, but to encourage, hey, if you're going to die, die in faith. Much better. <laughs> Much better. So these, they died in faith. And then it says, but having seen them afar off. So there's this distance. That, it was like a long way, but they knew there's a Messiah coming. They, they knew about Jesus. They knew about a cross, or they knew about redemption and atonement. But man, it was a long way away, thousands of years away. But they believed. Believed in something that there was no precedent for, that they had no knowledge of. There had never been a Savior before, so they, it was hard for them to articulate believing in a Savior when there had never been a Savior. They're preaching belief in a Savior, but there's never been one. How's that different from us? Well, we're believing back to the cross, but there's precedent because now we understand that he's the Savior and we understand who he is. We see the prophecies fulfilled and it is awesome. And so we go with our message. We come together. We're of one accord here, the church. We encourage one another and then we leave here ready for the mission field to tell people about the Savior who died and then rose, whom we have eternal life through. 
who we believe is, and we come to him, and that he rewards us for diligently seeking him, and that he'll reward everybody who diligently seeks him, and that they're pleasing to God because they're seeking. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out of, this is verse 15, they might have had opportunity to have returned. If they had been mindful, if they were preoccupied or settled where they were, they would have left and then come back. I could just see Abraham saying, well, I'm out of here. I'm going to go over to this place wherever God leads me. He ends up in Canaan, and Canaan is just like hot and it's hilly. And there's some nice parts, but where God planted him was not really that great. It was out in the desert most of the time. And he could be saying, you know what? I think Ur of the Chaldees was nicer. I had a nice pad back at Ur. And so he could have up and gone there, but then see, he understood that there's nothing better there. The grass wasn't greener over here or there. It's just that this is where God wants me to be and promised this to me. So I'm going to rest here. I'm going to tabernacle with the Lord here. I'm going to rest in him here. So all of them, they, they could have desired a better country, but they, I'm sorry, a better place, but they, they didn't. They understood who and where they were, that they were in Christ where they were at. So verse 16, but now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So there's a better country, a, a heavenly country. Kind of redefines country music, doesn't it? Heavenly music. It's like this is the good stuff, right? Not red solo cup. It's not that stuff. Some people would argue that's even country. The point being is that, no, it's better. It's better. It's better. It's a heavenly place. And if you're looking for a heavenly country, a heavenly city, everything else comes up short. Everything else comes up short. This is where it becomes important to wait upon God and trust him and take steps moving forward, but to wait upon him for his direction because sometimes we can settle for things that may not be what God wants. You could find yourself settling on, let's say you're going out to buy a house. It's just like, well, you know, the market is crazy and, and I can't, you know, you look at a house and then it's sold. So you got to do something real quick. And then sometimes people settle buying the house that they didn't really, they don't know if God's in that one or not. They're just like, I'm just so desperate. I'm just going to lay money down, go ahead and get into a mortgage and do it. People do this with relationships. I may never have another girlfriend. I may never have another boyfriend or spouse or whatever. And so he settled into things instead of waiting on God to help define it. Just relax. He'll reward you as you diligently seek him. You don't have to be presumptuous. You don't have to be in fear that he's not going to come through. He'll come through. So just wait. Just rest. And he'll speak to you, and then you'll know. And you'll go forward in that. So, anyway, little sideline to this. Let's go to verse 16. But now they desire a better country. That is uh, heavenly. I just read that. Let's go to verse 17. Abraham again, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he uh, that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Okay, so human sacrifice was unprecedented in God's view, okay? And so it's not something that was normal. And yet, God is saying, this is what I want you to do. I want you to offer your son. And this is crazy. If we were called to do this, now we would say, well, no, there's no biblical precedent other than Abraham. And the father, because he offered his one and only son, only begotten son. So, but there's no precedent. Abraham just believed it. Why? Because as we read through of whom, verse 18, of whom it was said in, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And as we were to read forward in Galatians, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. 
He doesn't say to seeds. It's not talking about Israel. It's talking about to the seed. And he says, as of many, but as one, and to your seed who is Christ. So what does this mean? Basically, trying to wrap this up quickly here, but this is important. It's basically saying Abraham knew that he could offer sacrifice, Isaac as a sacrifice, but one way or the other, the Messiah is coming through this line. So he's either going to have to resurrect him, or he's got some other plan, but he's going forward. So he's got to trust God. And Isaac was his only begotten son. And he was called, so he makes the three-day journey. And just as he's getting ready to take Isaac's life, and Isaac, it says that he was a lad, but it basically means that he was somebody that was not married yet. If you look at it, if you're careful with the scripture, you find out he's probably about 30 years old. And yet he willingly laid down upon that wood and was willing to be sacrificed. I believe he understood the prophecy that through his line would come the Messiah. So they're, they're both acting forward with prophecy in mind, knowing that God's got to work this out, because if, if you kill Isaac, that's it. It says his only begotten son. Well, what about Ishmael? Ishmael was not the son of promise. He's the only son of promise. So you could say that God's in sort of a predicament here. But then what ends up happening is he's getting ready to kill Isaac. Then he hears God's voice, Abraham. And then he points, or he acknowledges his faithfulness, and then they see this ram who's caught in the thicket. And they go and take that ram and sacrifice. And it's interesting on their walk up there that it specifically said, Abraham says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Foretelling or with a foreknowledge that he'll provide himself. He's the sacrifice in all of this. He's the seed. He's the one. And verse 19 goes on and says, Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him a figure. So it says, Accounting that God was able. He sort of took inventory. He says, well, okay, I got one son, and that one son is going to be the line that leads to the Messiah. So this is kind of a no-brainer. I don't have to try to figure this out for 20 sons or 100 sons. I've got one son that's a son of promise, and here it is. It's given to him. Take inventory. God's able to raise him up. And so he's in full awareness of the promise as Isaac would have been. And then in Genesis 27, verse 20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. So what is this? Well, Isaac is blessing them, and he does something unprecedented there. Most of the time, the blessings just came from God. But now Isaac is doing the blessing. And then he ends up blessing, and you'll remember the little switch between Isaac and Jacob, I'm sorry, Jacob and Esau, and how Jacob kind of said, I'm going to give out the blessings. And so Esau's out hunting, getting some good grub for pop, some stew, probably, chili. And while he's doing that, then Jacob dresses up like Esau. And he puts on goat skins, which have all this fur and stuff, which kind of tells us a little bit about Esau. <laughs> so puts this stuff on and then he smells like Esau but his voice is Jacob's and he ends up receiving the blessing of the firstborn and the fact is is that this blessing unprecedented as it is Isaac is giving a blessing which is prophetic having to do with how their lives would go and he did that by faith he did that trusting God verse 21 Talking about Jacob from Genesis 48 and 49. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning upon the top of his staff. So this is unprecedented in that Jacob ends up adopting the kids of his firstborn. But his firstborn was Reuben. So what's up with that? 
Actually, his 11th born was his first born with Rachel. Is that right? Yes. And so as a result, he lays hands on Joseph in a unique kind of way. He says, Joseph, I want you to bring your kids. I am adopting them. And he lays hands on the children of Joseph. And he can't see too well, but he's still wanting to bless. And so you have Manasseh and Ephraim, but he takes the right hand and puts it on Ephraim's head and puts his left hand, puts it on Manasseh's head, knowing that the right hand is the right hand of blessing. And he blesses the younger over the older. He's doing crazy things. But he does this with the full knowledge that there's a double portion that's going to be given. And he's worshiping God, it tells us. Worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. He stands up and worships. And you remember, this is the guy that wrestled with God. So he's got a limp, right? Because he prevailed over Jesus in this wrestling. And then Jesus touched him in the hip. And then from then on, he's just kind of limping. He's got a staff. He's got to get around him. Not a very good actor. But I'm good at limping. <laughs> so the point is, is that he's got this staff and he stands up and he worships God and blesses all the children, all of his kids. But his son Joseph gets a double blessing because Ephraim and Manasseh receive the blessing instead of Joseph. So again, it's by faith that he's doing this. He's stepping out and declaring something prophetic through the adoption of these two sons. And then lastly, verse 22, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Now, Joseph could just say, look, I'm going to be dead. What, what's, what's the deal? But he believed God's promise with regard to Canaan. He believed what God was going to do. From Genesis, it says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you, bring you out of this land unto the land which he swore unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It would be 400 years before this would happen, but it would happen. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, Surely, God surely will visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. He believed in the promise. And he took an oath of the children. And so what is Moses when they're leaving the promised land? He's got Joseph's bones with him as they're leaving. And that he would end up being, you know, buried in the promised land as they come in. That's Genesis. We covered it. Most of it. I think chapter 1 through 50. Pretty quick. It's a... It's a foundation of people stepping out, doing things that God called them to, but there was arguably no basis for it or no history for it. And so what are those things that God has called you to do? Maybe you've been wrestling with this for some time, fighting God with it, saying, well, no one else has done this. Why do you want me to do this? No one else is doing it. So you take a step of faith. And sadly, what are the things that you may be wrestling with that there is precedent for, but you're still not doing? That one's worse. That one's more difficult. And so I would bring us back to verse six. Specifically, without faith, it's impossible to do it. Our purpose for being created is to please God and each other. And so it begins. Come to God. Believe that He is. Know that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. Amen.